Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Dean's Conversation Series. We are very excited to once again have with us Chief Justice Ann Burke. Yes. Justice Burke is a longtime friend of John Marshall Law School and now UIC John yes. Marshall Law yes. School. She became Chief Justice in October of 2019. But for many years, she's been joining us in a forum like this to talk about issues of professionalism and what it's like to be a judge. And she has such an inspiring story that we're, we're so grateful that she continues to be with us. So welcome, Thank Chief you, Justice Dean. Burke. I'm thrilled to be here. So let's start out with your story. Tell us a little bit about you and your background and how you came to be a lawyer and then a judge. Oh. Okay, uh, <laughs> well, actually, I grew up in Chicago South Side uh, some many decades ago, and uh, not a very good student, so I gravitated towards sports. I became a gym uh, addict, so to speak. I played basketball, volleyball, twirl baton, swimming lessons in the Chicago Park District. Then I entered um, the uh, George Williams College to be a phys ed teacher for one year, and I ended up dropping out after a year. Um, not because I flunked out, although I would have flunked out the following year when if I took kinesiology, but I dropped out because the school I went to actually moved. Mm. It moved to, from Chicago's High Park area to a western suburb. Uh, Mr. Cross would know it near Downers Grove. Um, he's a 1L, and his father's a friend of mine, so that's why I'm pointing him out. Um, Anyway, I grew up in the parks, became a phys ed teacher for the Chicago Park District, and in 1968, I wrote a letter to Mrs. Eunice Kennedy Shriver to uh, fund a track meet that I wanted to put, in, put on in Soldier Field for persons with learning dis differences, and that was the first Special Olympics. So I was involved <coughs> in the sp first Special Olympics from the very beginning. Uh, even to this day, to some degree. But during that period of time, not having my college degree, um, my family, my husband especially, would say to me, you know a lot about people with learning disabilities, but no one's gonna pay attention to you until you have your college degree. So I went back to school, to Paul University, after I had three children, and it was a school for um, more mature people, uh, the School for New Learning for people who want to go back to school after having a somewhat of a career. Then we had our fourth child after I graduated, and um, the same story came from my husband. He said, uh, you'd be a better advocate for those vulnerable people that you care about if you had a law degree. So of course, that was what we would call in Chicago Southside the Irish Catholic guilt. So I did go back to law school, but it was very difficult because somewhere in that time of being you know, more mature person going back to college and going to law school, I learned what the reason was that why I uh, wasn't a good student and I never really got more than C's in school at any level. Uh, I'm dyslexic and that was the reason why I really kind of enjoyed life early on being a gym teacher and doing the things I love to do because I didn't have to worry about reading or numbers or anything because I transpose things. I still do today. It's not good when you have to checkbook. But of course, <laughs> I, that's, now, they, now everything's online and they correct it for you. But you over overcame all of those challenges? I came, came, I, well, I didn't overcome dyslexia, but I learned to get through it and also to the accommodations that one can do in, in, uh, when you have a learning disability. It's not that hard. I had, I've had tutors and, you know, to help me get through the bar exam and things like that. So that's where I am today and that's why I went to law school, because of people who were vulnerable in society. But of course, um, I just fell in love with law school. I really did. It's about people and it's about what people do to each other and trying to figure it out and trying to help. And so it's still the same mental attitude. And I think that I, you know, I admire every one of you for thinking about the law for yourselves and for others. It is an important degree to have. Uh, whether you ever practice law or not, you will be a critical thinking person the rest of your life. So I congratulate you for embarking on that. And then when did your judicial route start? Well, that actually, uh, by the time I graduated from law school, um, I had four children under 10, and I was 40 years old. 
so that was a more mature person. And all of our social friends, most of them were lawyers. And one of them was Governor Jim Thompson. Even though he's a Republican and we're Democrats, he thought in 1987 um, that he needed uh, to appoint a woman to the Illinois Court of Claims. And so he had an opportunity to appoint some Democrats and some Republicans, and I was the first woman that he appointed to the Court of Claims. And that's a legislative com uh, court that um, is existing because states have sovereign immunity. But the state also provides the opportunity for someone to sue the state in certain circumstances. So that was my first judicial career. So you ultimately made it to the Illinois Supreme Court. Yeah, ultimately. Talk to us a little bit. Um, the Illinois Supreme Court's a little bit different because you live in your workplace for part we of the do. years. Can you tell the students about that? Yes, um, most people, because the dean does know, but most people have no idea, whether they're lawyers or not, that um, the courthouse that was built in Springfield in 1908 was built with the idea in mind to house the Supreme Court justices. Now, why is that? It's because the Constitution of the state of Illinois is divided in five judicial districts. So by Constitution, we are geographically diverse. We will always have somebody from every corner of the state of Illinois. And with that in mind, when they built the, house, the Supreme Court building, they put residences on the third floor above the courthouse, the courtroom. So since 1908, there are seven rooms for the seven justices, and at the time, in 1908, law clerks would come with the justices. Uh, now they don't, we have, uh, they don't, but we have, we have marshals that unfortunately we have, but they, so they live on the third floor with us, and we take all our meals together. Outside the door of each one of the rooms is, uh, names the justice who has lived in that room. So each room has a history, at least since 1908. For instance, the first room that I moved into was the James Cartwright suite. James Cartwright came onto the Illinois Supreme Court in the late 1800s, but he moved into that room, named after him, in 1908. Very interesting man. Um, all of them are, I, I would say, and women. Uh, but he especially, he wrote a case in which you probably are not familiar with, but it was a case in which the, the lakefront of, of Chicago along Michigan, uh, Lake Michigan was in jeopardy. It, uh, there, were, was, there were people who wanted to build um, buildings along the lake, and the, there was a, uh, a lawsuit, and James Cartwright kept the lake Free, Open, and Clear. And in fact, that's the name of a book, Open, Free, and Clear, Keeping the Lakefront Open, Free, and Clear. He also wrote another case that kept um, a certain town in Alton, Illinois, Southern Illinois, with integrated schools, because at the turn of the century, it was integrated. It was a place in crossing the Mississippi River where freed slaves would come. and live in Alton, Illinois, and Gregory, and they were assimilated into the community. There was integrated schools and businesses, uh, uh, black uh, individuals became businessmen, doctors, lawyers, in Alton. And the city council in the early 1900s wanted to have segregated schools. So that case came up to the Illinois Supreme Court five different times, and James Cartwright ruled that it had to stay integrated. But, no one enforced it until 1955. Those schools remained segregated in Alton, Illinois, even though the Supreme Court ruled, um, until 1955. The sheriff would not enforce it. Terrible. Another person who lived in my bedroom was Seymour Simon. Seymour uh, was an alderman. He was an alderman with my father-in-law and my husband, president of the county board, on the appellate court, and became an Illinois Supreme Court justice. So when I saw his name on that door, I took a picture of the plaque 
and Justice Simon was retired from the court at the time, but he was in the hospital. So I came back from Springfield and I showed him the photograph and I said, Justice Simon, I'm sleeping in your bedroom. <laughs> and he said, say it louder so the nurses can hear. <laughs> <laughs> but the history of the court is amazing. And I know that you had given me some preliminary questions, and one I can't help myself without ask, having you ask, is about the- The tunnels? The tunnels. I hear there are tunnels under there the There are building. tunnels. Um, it, and it happened the, as the lore goes. There is a tunnel from the Capitol building underneath uh, 2nd Avenue into the Supreme Courthouse. Now, how did all that happen? The Capitol building that's down there now is where the Supreme Court met. They met there is what is now the Senate hearing room. And there was a card game one night between the governor and the male Supreme Court justices. And there was probably a lot of Manhattans and smoking and things like that too, I suspect. But anyway, the governor allegedly said, if I lose this game, you get your building. So I can imagine that the justices were saying, we need our own building, we need our own building, and the governor said, no, no. Well, obviously he lost the game, and we have our own building, because the timing of all that <coughs> is when this, was, this person was the governor, and his, his name is on the plaque in 1908, dedicating the building. But I just want everyone to know, we have wrought iron gates and padlocks, so nobody can come in from the legislature into our building now. So you can't use the tunnels? You can't use the tunnels. Uh. But it's there. If you ever come down, I could show it to you. So talk to us a little bit about what your role, how your role is different now that you're Chief Justice. What does the Chief Justice do? Well, the Chief Justice has to go to a lot of things. Um, and and the, the worst possible thing for me is I just told you I'm dyslexic. So numbers and I really don't get along. So I'm in the process now of having a tutorial by many people on how to talk about the budget mm. for the Supreme Court when I see the legislature <laughs> next month. <laughs> So we'll see how that goes. But that is one thing, um, is part of the job. And it's really seamless because it, the Constitution provides that this, the, just, the Chief Justice will be the next most senior person and it's a term of three years. So everybody has to do it. The five justices who are on the court now, including Justice Thomas until February 29th, there's five former, chief, or former just, justices, chiefs that help each other. So I mean, it's pretty, pretty nice to have a lot of experience that people are willing to help you. But we've been opening events, um, visiting people, going to a lot of conferences. I just came back from the National Conference of Chief Justices, in which the dean knows the, direct, the, the head of that. And um, it's fascinating to see how other states work and do their job Many chief justices are elected f by running full s the whole state votes for them to be chief justice, or the rest of the court votes. But it's not always seamless. Like we have a turn. I mean, we are in rotation because of seniority. They have to lobby each other uh, to be the chief justice, and I, you know, you make enemies when you have to do that. So, in, when you need four votes to get out of a seven to get an opinion out and you've made enemies, it's not a good thing. So that's why living together to, in our situation has provided an opportunity for collegiality that is so unbelievably wonderful. Our, my court now, as we've, I've been on the court 14 years, we have traveled to Europe together because we're friends. We have gone to New York to see shows together, Chicago, out for dinner with our significant others and spouses. Why is that? It's because we have strict rules about discussion of court matters. And that's only done in the conference room behind the court, the bench, in the courthouse. Outside of that room, we do not discuss court matters at all. No, no administration matters. If we have something to say to each other, we do a memo that's electronically generated to everybody at the same time, whether it be a decision or a vote for someone to be appointed to a committee. 
So when we're together in the courthouse, having dinner together or with each other, we're talking about our grandchildren, who's going to college, whose knee's been replaced, things like that. <laughs> well, we were very honored on Monday night to host a forum for the six candidates running for the open, or one of the now open, Supreme Court seats. Yep. But what was exciting the next day, it was announced that one of our alums, Michael Burke, no relation, as yes, I understand no, no it, relation. is going to be succeeding someone retiring from the court. He'll be on the court Justice for Justice Robert Thomas. He'll be on the court for a couple of years. Yes. And that's, I think Illinois has a bit of an unusual way of appointing successors for someone who retires midterm. So yes. can you, so we know yes. that justices are elected generally, but there's this appointment process. Can you talk to us yes, about that? Yes, the Constitution that? provides that not only can the Supreme Court um, appoint someone to the Supreme Court, appellate court and trial court, is because when there is a vacancy, most of the time and historically, that vacancy needs to be filled by someone who is qualified in, in a short term. And elections occur, general elections usually occur every two years or three years or four years, things like that. And, um, so how it works for the Supreme Court is there's three of us in Cook County who are on the Illinois Supreme Court because the state is divided into five judicial districts based on population. So there's three of us. So if there is a vacancy on the trial court, appellate court, or even the Supreme Court because of one of us, one of us in rotation will have the opportunity. So if I appointed someone to the circuit court last time, then the next person in line would get the opportunity to do the next person. But if I should retire from the Supreme Court willingly by myself and not by an act of God, um, I'm able to nominate someone for uh, the position of the Supreme Court. And it's a process that each one of us take very seriously. Uh, it, it should be, it has been, there's nothing written in stone, but somebody who's had some, some trial experience, a trial court judge, an appellate court judge, or a judge of some sort before they become a Supreme Court judge. Just some judicial experience. Um, before. And also the other qualities is because when we live together, we have to get along, right? And so you have to have someone whose temperament is such that they're willing to collaborate and cooperate and be friends with their colleagues, yet be able to be definitive on decision making and stick to their guns, so long as it's based on the law. And that's why there's seven justices. So you just can't say, when I get on the Supreme Court, I'm going to do this or do that. That never happens, because you need four votes to get whatever done you want done. I just recently nominated three people to a commission, redeploy, which is a, it's a legislative commission. I nominated them. And I circulated a request with background and resumes and experience to all my colleagues. And on that request was a vote sheet for, against, or let's talk about it next time we're in Springfield. And so I just called the people today. They, were all, they all were elected or nominated. But anything you do has to be in consideration of your colleagues. I mean. You're moving in with them. You're working with them in very close quarters. When we're in term five times a year in January, March, May, September, and November, we live together that time. And we work together very intensely in the conference room. We don't get out of that conference room until 6 o'clock every day. But you know all the administrative work that we have to do with, with the court. So, and everything is done by vote. We respect each other's input. So when someone nominates a, a replacement, it goes to the other justices on the court oh, for yes. input. Does it have to go anywhere else? Or once the justices no. agree, you, you can announce it? Yes, correct. Once, there, you, once you have four votes, and deference generally is given to your colleague, um, 
after you've read, but if you have uh, a problem with the person, um, you can vote against, which has been done, or you can say, let's talk about it. And um, we would have, we meet in March again, we would talk about it in March. It would be delayed until March. So some of our students, I imagine, are in our lawyering skills three class and are hard at work at some appellate briefs, and they probably think that the professors are hazing them <laughs> and simply making them do this project. Can you talk to the students about how you, as a Supreme Court justice, use briefs written by lawyers? Oh, we, we more than use them. We dissect them, so remember that. Uh, briefs are what we have and the transcripts of the record. You know, and you can't presume anything in the law. You have to have a fact, some evidence, or a case. So you better make sure your best shot is in that brief and followed by good law. But now for oral argument, that's a different story. We like conversation. We like you to discuss with us what the case is about. We are going to read and dissect those briefs. And where you fail is if it's sloppy, if you don't have good sentences, if it isn't, if it's short, is good. Length is, you could get to the point quicker in a lot of cases. So that's what you should do is stick to the point and don't ramble. You don't need to do string citing. The most important case and a few others. But those briefs are the basis of our decision making with the record. So, but when you don't really see that during oral argument, which I prefer, some of my colleagues don't mind talking about some of the cases. I figured, well, I'm gonna read the cases, I'm gonna figure it out, but I wanna know really what this case is about. What is, what is the dynamics behind it and why? So talk to the students about the process the court uses to decide a case. So to what, decide the case. What well, happens? first of all, it's picking the case. Well, let's talk about picking that case. That might be even more interesting. The How do you pick what you for hear? leave to appeal. Um, we decide what we want to hear. Um, it, but we do have some standards and some requirements. It would be a constitutional issue. Um, it has to be something that's a necessity. There's several uh, uh, judicial districts, appellate districts, that are different and in their decision making or it cries out to be adjudicated, or it's something that really has never been in a long time reviewed and updated, um, legislative matters. So on those issues, and it may be even a policy question that we need to dig into, uh, which we are able to do where the appellate court can't. So that PLA writing is an art, and I think Justice Fassard could attest to that because you know, their decisions um, the, and the, uh, the appellate court are key to whether it would be a good PLA. So whoever wrote the decision in the appellate court would highlight what's needed to be said in the Supreme Court. And I can remember when I was on the court with Justice Fassard is that you try, if, some, if the Supreme Court needs to address this as an appellate court justice, where, there you, are, you need to say something in your decision. This would be something for the legislature to look at, perhaps, and things like that in a nice way. So PLAs are very important. So that, that is an art in itself, just trying to figure out to get our attention, because there's no reply brief. We have to figure out on the petition for leave to appeal itself whether or not we want to hear that case. Now, oftentimes, uh, that issue has come before us several times, and we've never taken a case. But the right case hasn't been there. But if we choose to take a case on that issue and more come in on that issue, we will hold them until we decide on that, on that particular case. We'll hold that case for a while. And does it take four votes to hear something? It takes four votes for a petition for leave to appeal. But one of the unbelievable things that I didn't know before I got on the Supreme Court is I was able to become an advocate again for, that I was not able to do before. I, I love juvenile cases. 
and I love probate, oh, I love all the cases, but I mean, particularly I have an interest in probate court and juvenile court. And if I am the only one voting for that petition for leave to appeal, and I think this court should really review it, then I would ask that that petition for leave to, be, uh, for leave to appeal be discussed at our a PLA hearing. We have a, a whole day devoted to PLAs, and I could ask for that one to be discussed. And there, I could argue my case why the court should take this. And that's happened. Other people have changed their mind and took the case. So that whatever you write is important. That's what I'm trying to say to you. So, but be concise and be accurate, and that will help because if you start being sloppy and and misciting or not telling us by omission, not telling us the case that's relevant, then we don't have trust in your brief. And we need to trust you. And that's an important factor. Do you, do you have any sense generally about how many PLAs come in a year and how many are granted? Yes. <laughs> um, when I first came on to the court, every term, which was five terms, there were at least 500, 450 petitions for leave to appeal that we'd have to read and decide before we read the cases that we're going to hear, right? So it's a, it's a quick process. In my chambers, um, we all review all of them, but we, the ones that we, we all pick out the ones we want to go to look at together, and then we decide, as with my four law clerks, the, the, did they fit the criteria? And then we weed them out. Most times, it's between 15 to 18 to 20 now that we take a term. This coming up in March, we only have 11. But there's a lot of things with regard to that. And that's because filings are down. It's endemic across the country about unrepresented people and people unable to hire a lawyer to file an appeal, to file a petition for leave to appeal in the Supreme Court. It's very expensive, so as young people or I, sh I was never a young lawyer, I was older, but I just say is as new lawyers, we all have to work together on finding ways to help unrepresented people. And I have some ideas, Dean, so. But Do you wanna share? I will, but I wanna finish this deciding cases. Okay. Um, every, when we go out for oral argument, it's, we have a grid, one to seven. Right now I'm still number uh, five on the grid. In March, I'll be number four on the grid, as in seniority. So if I had the last case, last term, that means number five on the grid will get the first case in March. That is how we choose who the author of the case is. Nothing more than that. I mean, it's very simple. But then you go through the process of recusals. Who has to recuse and things like that, not, not participate. So. When we go out, we already know who's going to be the author. But really, you can't tell. We've, we've, only, we've all just read the cases as, uh, and the briefs, and, and maybe the seminal cases, but we really haven't dug into the file. So we really have no idea what we're going to decide this case. And, and so when we do decide it, after oral argument, we might have had a preliminary idea how we might think about voting on this case. So we vote what the, we call an impression vote. I think I'm going to go this way. And it's actually kind of interesting because a good percentage of the time you've totally changed your mind uh, once you've got into the, into the, to the briefs and, and all. But it still takes four um, votes. So during terms, the author writes it, circulates it, and you will know by receiving con concurring opinions or dissents with, before we meet next time who's with you and who isn't, and you still have an opportunity to discuss it and try to come to a conclusion where you might have missed something and you would alter your original draft in, in, to the wishes of to one of your colleagues so you can get consensus without prostituting yourself in your legal opinion. So um, one of the ways in which I think we all can help is continuing legal education. I think, and I'm probably going out on a limb on this, we ask lawyers to do pro bono work, and we require lawyers to do continuing legal education. 
I believe that if a lawyer who's um, excellent in probate court and that presiding judge knows that Hudson Cross is an excellent probate judge or lawyer, I can appoint him to do probate work and the presiding judge could sign off of it and that lawyer should get CLE credit mm. for it. Now, the structure of that system would have to be, you know, I'm going to propose this, is discussed. But I think because we are at such a crisis in our democracy about access to justice, and it's not just here, it's across the country, access to justice is being diminished, so therefore our democracy is being diminished if we can't get people in the courthouses. And so we have to figure out ways to do that. And you know, we all have to make a living, but if we have good lawyers who will do pro bono work and get something for it, continuing legal education in whatever value it is, as long as it's supervised in a, in a structure, we should do that. I'm gonna ask one more question, and then we're gonna open it up to the audience. So be thinking about what question you might wanna ask the Chief Justice. So we have an externship program here, and I'm sure somebody sitting out there thinking, how might I be your extern, or is there a way after graduation to be a clerk for a Supreme Court justice? How does that work? All right, well, the first question is easier. Uh, I love externs. I always had externs when I was on the appellate court. I had to have a 3L. Uh, you can apply when you're a 2L to be in any one of the, either summer or any semester as a 3L for credit, hopefully, to be an extern with me. And I take two or three every semester and I think it's great experience. Some of my other colleagues do the same, and I know some of, I think some of the appellate court justices still do it. So that's great experience. Um, now being a Supreme Court clerk is harder because it's hard to get up to speed. Being an appellate court clerk first is the first, I think the first step, or research attorney in the appellate court. Now, all the judicial districts in the state have research offices and they need attorneys. It would be good to try to get jobs there to do some appellate work to see what it's like. And you'll be hired as, you know, with that experience behind you. And Dean Frassard knows a lot about that. So she does. Anyone, she knows tons anyone of sitting that. here saying that sounds good to me, see Dean Frassard and she yes, can be yeah. helpful. And then on the externship, um, Dean Fassard knows a lot yeah, about that yeah, as well, yeah. but Professor Bacon Bess is now running our externship and she also knows how to help you with that. Mm -hmm. So I have a few more questions if there are gaps, but what an opportunity you have. We have about 25 minutes. We have the Chief Justice of the Illinois Supreme Court right here. We have a microphone in the back. If you'd like to ask a question, raise your hand and Peggy will bring the mic up to you. Um, I just loved your emphasis on um, representation for vulnerable groups, especially minority groups. And I grew up in Alabama, so I feel like I, I've seen a lot of um, how our system has changed. And I just want to know, do you see a huge difference on the representation for groups that aren't necessarily included now compared to before? And how do you think our system can improve? Well, um, the unrepresented um, individuals aren't just minorities now and uh, vulnerable populations, people with disabilities. It's everyone, low, you know, low income, whether you're a minority or not. It's a crisis, and I'm, I don't see enough being done. And let me just say that. Yes, there's a lot of uh, legal assistance foundations, but they don't have enough people. And so we have to reach out to the broader community of lawyers to help us here. Um, oftentimes, you know, uh, law schools have legal clinics and things like that. But the first step is the individual in the communities anywhere who's afraid to go to the courthouse. Number one, if they were to come to the Daily Center, uh, you know, even for a traffic ticket, it's $49 for the parking garage. There, so it's a, it's a deterrent to even come to the courthouse for that. Um, and, and then there's fi fines and fees, which we have to look at for the costs for, and then there's these forms that 
our Access to Justice Commission is working on to unify. And because our state has 102 counties, we're trying to unify all the circuits. There's um, 24 circuits, but 102 counties. So, but we have 102 circuit court clerks, 102 sheriffs, 102 uh, county boards that fund the court system. So we ha to do e-filing, it's a major work to try to get everybody on the same page so we can collect information. We don't, you know, some counties don't even have one lawyer. So we really need to think about what we need to do as an individual to, uh, if you're going into the practice of law, then you need to think about what your priorities should be in life for a while anyway to help the more vulnerable people. Even though some people are working, <coughs> but they can't afford a lawyer. So I know there's all different kinds of things like fee schedules that are around the country that we've, we're, we're trying to consider that as well. And uh, so you can say you could do a, maybe a divorce for X amount of dollars. That would be in the fee schedule. Um, and more people could have access to our court system. Um, so there's so much work to be in so many different areas. I could go on and on about it. But the idea that you're aware that other states have the same problem is so wherever you are or where you land, um, and now with the UBE, you can go a lot of places, um, thanks to the dean, um, we, you're, you're going to be able to make a lot of contributions to society as an individual, as a lawyer. Other questions? I always want to know about work-life balance. How did you handle that, having, what was it, four children? Four children under, the under age of 10, 10 when I started law school. And those were real diapers, right? Oh, well, one was, the others weren't <laughs> by then. It wasn't that long ago. Although my oldest uh, daughter will be 50 in July, and she is an attorney. And my youngest daughter, I think she's 46. I don't even know now. Uh, don't <laughs> tell her. But she's an attorney as well. But interestingly enough, um, she's working for a, a big uh, hospital in Chicago because they wanted to hire somebody who had a critical thinking degree as a lawyer in, in a very critical position. So the, the job market is not exclusively just practicing law. So remember that. There's, she's in a great position in a great hospital and doing all kinds of things because she has a critical thinking degree. So um, working balance, well, I, I had opportunity to have a husband to provide a, 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 a a babysitter for me during the day. I decided I'd go to school when the kids went to school in the morning. So we packed up our lunches, went to day uh, school for law school, and by the time I got home, you know, um, we had dinner. I went to bed with, after they did their homework, and I got up at 4 o'clock. So I could have peace and quiet. I was rested. Um, I still get up at 4 o'clock. I haven't been able to break that habit. It's just like, just to get up early in the morning now. But you do it, and I had a lot of extended family members. Uh, my sister and people would help me. Weekends, I just put myself in the basement to study or came to school to study, with, and you know, those kinds of things. So I, people can do it if they have help and encouragement. I, had, I, was, I went because I was encouraged. If I wasn't encouraged, it never would have occurred to me that I could do it, but every step of the way. So you, it's your job to encourage somebody. Never tell anybody they can't do it or they shouldn't do something. If it's in their heart, they should do it, and you should encourage them. I, I can recall a situation, and I won't um, get into it too much, but when I was finishing and exiting law school, I was told by somebody that I took up somebody's space who was younger and I shouldn't have gone to school. Shouldn't have gone to law school at my age. I'm so glad I wasn't a younger person who didn't have um, some sort of a life before to know that this is what I really wanted. But that is the most discouraging thing you could ever do. Um, 
is to tell somebody that after you know they've really wanted to do something. And the same holds true. Um, one more point I think is important to you, and that is always be kind. I don't care what you do or who you're talking to, be kind, and especially in the legal system. If, like for judges, I tell judges all the time, if you're kind on the bench to somebody, they're going to think that this might, they might be getting justice. Wouldn't that be transforming, that they're against the, uh, the system so much? But talking to each other in kind ways is important, even in school. Don't be mean. Be always encouraging someone. And I think that'll go a long way if you're kind. Be kind to people. Oh, uh-oh, the professor. <laughs> mm, okay. hey, uh, thank, you. thank you for coming here okay. today, uh, Justice Burke, and thank you for your advocacy and explaining the court to everyone. Um, this uh, way of assigning the cases, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yes. what happens when it's assigned to someone who's in dissent? Do they switch with someone else, or, do, or is it issued as a per courier? I'm sorry, someone what? Do they, if someone's in the dissent, Oh, it's not, oh it's no. to write the majority. Do they switch with someone, or no. is it issued as a, as it, a There's a process. There's a, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, if, you know, I'm really decided after trying, say it's my case, um, I've really tried to collaborate and get a consensus on this case. However, I just can't go that far. So I will take what we call a reject. It's a reject. So the next person on the grid, after me, say I'm number four, the next person on the grid is number five, and they've disagreed with me, and they wrote the, um, the majority opinion, they'll get it. But it's not saying, would you take my case for me, you know, that kind of thing. No, it's, it's according to the grid. So if I take a reject as number four, then number five, if, if number five wrote um, the, uh, the dissent or the, the majority way the court likes to go, um, then that person would get the case. But if that person, number five, was with me, then it'd go to four. How did four do? Did four, was four the majority? Because remember, you only need four, and I might have only had three. Is that okay? Okay. Justice Burke, thank you so much. Um, I, my name is Erica, and I'm also a uh, second career, you know, for me. And so this was wonderful to hear your story. I'm particularly interested in legislative law, and you talked about appointing people to legislative committees. Can you tell me what the criteria is and um, what you're looking for in those appointments? Okay. Well, recently, as I said, um, the commission, it was a legislative commission called Redeploy. It's a, a commission that oversees probation services for the state level. It's a legislative commission. And um, I can't tell you off the top of my head uh, what the legislation says, who gets a chance to appoint, but the Supreme Court, Court does appoint people to this Redeploy Probation Services Oversight Board. I would imagine leadership, the governor might have somebody, things like that, and some, are, some skill sets are required. Um, somebody who might be familiar uh, with uh, probation, a probation officer. One of my appointees has, is a pro, uh, oversees probation and juvenile. Uh, and I appointed a judge. Sometimes they want judges who deals with um, criminal matters and knows the workings of probation and what's needed. So that would be a person that I would look for, somebody who's like that. And then the third person is a public defender down in Southern Illinois whose clients have been or will need probation officers. So each legislative commission, now there's the Illinois Supreme Court Historic Preservation Commission, which is another um, legislative commission, which the Supreme Court can appoint people to, as the speaker and the, the leadership can appoint people to. Uh, and, and they would have some interest in historic preservation, or maybe not, um, but some qualifications. Where can students find maybe a list of these 
different commissions? Is it on uh, the well, webs a website? There, well, the, le just the legislature probably has a, le a uh, or there is a website of legislative commissions in both uh, the House and the Senate, I would imagine. Um, I think that would be, so now for Supreme Court, we have over 22 committees and commissions, which we oversee, one, in, one is which the Board of Bar Admissions, the Attorney Registration Disciplinary Commission, the CLE Board, uh, Professional Responsibility, Professionalism, the Access to Justice Commission. And in those commissions that we appoint everybody to, um, we're looking for skill sets that help for access for justice. Maybe it would be somebody who's been with a non-for-profit who's been doing this. They would be a per perfect person for access to justice. Somebody who um, you know, can help with forms or statistics, um, people like that. And of course, for all the other commissions, whatever the topic is, we try to find somebody who's had some experience in the area. So you can go on our website and see all the commissions and committees that we uh, oversee. And without them, and their work, we could do nothing. Nothing. Thank you, yes. Chief Justice, for being here. Um, for those of us who don't know, myself included, <coughs> would you explain to us the A to Z process of what goes into writing an opinion? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, writing an opinion. Well, first of all, you have to um, be very familiar now with the law um, and very familiar with the facts of this particular case. You never can presume that, uh, that this case is like any other case because almost 100% sure this case is not like any other case. So there's always going to be something about it that's different. So you just have to make sure you know the facts so well and the facts that you need to decide the matter, depending on what the issue is, and, and just get it down on paper. And then start finding the cases to fit those facts. And I have to say that you, we talked about brief writing um, and PLAs and the transcripts from the case. That's what we use to put a decision together. And then it sounds like one, if you've been assigned to write an opinion for the court, you circulate it to everyone oh, and, yes. and get feedback and see how many people you can get to sign on to the opinion. It, on the draft, on the draft. And then we have um, the, all the court weighs in, as I say, you know, with a, even just a memo on I mean, you forgot this or something like that. And then it's still a draft until we get into the room during term called Circulating Opinion Day, and that's the first day of our term in March, where we go head to head and get that, those opinions done. We talk about them, we get them done if we can, and if not, then we might have to do some tweaking. Maybe it'll be next week when we get together again, or maybe next term if we, if we have to. Are you willing to share with us how you involve your law clerks in the opinion drafting process? Well, as I said that I'm dyslexic, you would still be waiting for my first draft 14 years ago if I had to get from here to the paper uh, as fast as uh, we can. So after, well, all our cases are, um, my law clerks are familiar with every case that is being heard. We have memos on it, or the whole, Chambers is familiar with it. They watch the streaming video. And in fact, last uh, term um, in January, the first oral argument day, it was live on ABC, mm -hmm. uh, which it should be. Uh, but there was a case that they were interested in. That's the only reason. But it, you can get it you know, th that same day as we have oral argument. And um, so when I come back, we discuss it, discuss the case, go through what we think should be done. And they get the first draft for me and then we circulate it and, um, between ourselves. And then um, one of my clerks, though, is the uh, point person. The others read it and tear it apart. And then my drafting clerk and I go back at it again. And then we circulate it to them again. And they tear it apart again. So within my chambers, 
it is a very rigorous thing before it even gets to my colleagues. Do you have one Four. drafting clerk or does that drafting responsibility rotate among oh, your Oh, everybody has some drafting. Okay. If, if, if it's my case, then whoever is next gets that case. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yes. Everybody has to do everything. So this is a weeks and maybe months long process oh, to get months, the opinions months. out. Question up here. Yes. Yes, I want to thank you again for coming and speaking with us. Um, my question is, what are some of uh, what are some of the biggest challenges or problems facing new attorneys? Facing me is what? Facing uh, new attorneys. Facing biggest new challenges attorneys. Oh. facing new attorneys. Okay. <coughs> Thinking you know what you want to do. <laughs> you have no clue of all the wonderful areas of law that are out there. And um, Really, it's exciting. I, you know, I thought maybe I wanted to be a public defender and things like that, but I, and I did criminal law, but I couldn't because I was too old to go into a, a place to do that. But needless to say, thinking that you, you know what you want to do, I would use every second I can to go over to the Daily Center and just sit in that courthouse and listen. For instance, when I was practicing law, um, I loved guardianship cases. People, you know, people who were allegedly disabled and people who were disabled. And one time I became, oh, well, I did become a guardian at litem slash attorney for a fetus in an abortion hearing. It was a five day trial. I represented in, Il in Illinois, the, puter the mother, the biological mother was, had bipolar manic depressive disorder. She got pregnant and her mother, the putative grandmother, came into court to get temporary custody of this 28-year-old woman who got pregnant to have an abortion. Well, it was too late. But so the court appointed an attorney to represent the fetus, an attorney to represent uh, the, uh, the woman, and the mother, the grandmother had an attorney. And I represented the fetus. So I went out and I got um, a psychiatrist free of charge to interview the, the woman and come up with a, uh, you know, a, a, a recommendation. Um, I talked to Lutheran Social Services, Catholic Charities, to go through the process for adoption if there was no abortion, and what services would be available, what counseling for the mother, and all these kind of things. As it turned out, it was a five-day trial. And the, the doctor, who was a Navy psychiatrist, had also treated 500 bipolar, manic, depressive, pregnant women in his practice. So he had a lot of experience. It was hard to refute what he had to say. He said that she was misdiagnosed. And if she was on proper medication and found out she had an abortion, she may go freak out again. So the judge uh, did not grant the abortion. The baby was born very healthy and given up for adoption. You know, I mean, who would think in probate court on the 18th floor that you walk into a courtroom and see a case like that? Um, and, and then there, was, there were other kinds of cases in which you, the fighting over Aunt Nellie's you know, grandfather clock in probate court on wills and things like that. They spend more money on the attorneys than they do on, the, on the, what they would get. But I mean, it's in, in divorce cases. I mean, custody cases, minors custody cases are fascinating. Juvenile court, you should be over there watching these cases. And you'll, you, who knows, but you may be piqued um, your interest and your love of what you love in life um, as a result of seeing what's out there before you think you know everything. You know, learning to be a good lawyer is, is, is very important, of course, but you should also do what you love to do, and it, whether it be in the area of law or not. Um, but it's important. It's, otherwise, you wouldn't be as old as I am and still doing what you do unless you really liked it. One more question. Oh, we have two. We'll take two final questions. Thank you, uh, Justice Burke, for being here uh, today. So I had a question uh, in our torts uh, class, we learned about statutes of repose and how they oh. were considered constitutional in Illinois. <laughs> and uh, most of our classmates uh, 
believe that it, you know, they, it violated due process. So my question for you was, do you believe statutes of repose uh, are constitutional or do violate due process? Or if not, you know, really quickly, why do you believe that they are, um, they're not unconstitutional? Well, first of all, I have to give you a tutorial about judges. They can't give an opinion on anything <laughs> because it may come before me. I, 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 I have in my judicial career had to look at statutes of repose. You might as well Google the Supreme Court and see which cases, and then you might get an idea whether I dissented or not But in that case. But I can't give opinions on that, on, on con anything constitutional or things like that. Um, I do have an opinion, but it doesn't mean I can use it. <laughs> Final question. Justice Burke, thank you for uh, speaking with us today. Um, my question is, how, if at all, does outside political pressure have an influence on the cases that the court hears? Nothing. Um, it has absolutely no pressure. Um, I mean, it's not that we're oblivious to it. And clearly, um, we run uh, for our judicial spots, as I was talking to the dean earlier, um, on a political ticket. But once you become a judge, you can't use your opinion on anything. So what's the point? If you looked at um, the decisions coming out of our court, you, and if you didn't know, you couldn't tell that person was a Republican or a Democrat. Yes, somebody might be more conservative than the other in some issues, but on other issues, they may not be. I mean, so if you just took labels off of people and, and politics off of them, it, especially in our court, I can't say that for other places. I mean, the United States Supreme Court, they're appointed because they have ideologies. Uh, Expected to use them, I think. So, not in Illinois, okay? Let me just say that. And we can get rid of our judges. If you don't like the way we rule, you can not vote for us next time. That doesn't happen everywhere. Chief Justice, thank you so much for thank being you, with Dean. us again thank today. You, Dean. We appreciate it. <laughs>